Good afternoon. My name is Stanley Yaki. I was born in Hungary in 1924. I am a priest of the Benedictine Order. I have a doctorate in theology from the Pontifical Institute in Rome and a doctorate in physics from Fordham University, where I studied under the Nobel laureate Victor Hess, one of the discoverers of cosmic rays. I am a distinguished professor at Seton Hall University. I was a Gifford lecturer at the University of Edinburgh and Fremantle lecturer at Balliol College, Oxford. I was awarded the Le Comte de Noue Prize in 1970 and the Templeton Prize in 1987. I've written over 50 books and hundreds of essays on the history of science, the philosophy of science, and the relation between science and the Christian faith that I have lectured around the world. However, I was so excited to be invited to speak here at the Portsmouth Institute that I made this a top priority, even though I died in 2008. <laughs> And although I have not written any new material since then, most of what you will hear today is taken verbatim from a variety of my works. And amazing though it may be, for me to be lecturing here after my death, how much more astonishing if Jesus Christ himself, risen from the dead, were to be speaking to you, or to a group of scientists from this very podium. What would he say to a gathering of scientists and what would they tell him? He would, of course, tell them that he had come to save them for eternal life, a message which most of them would not be interested in at all. In turn, they would tell him things that, humanly speaking, would make the Son of God utterly speechless insofar as his human knowledge is concerned. Some quantum cosmologists would tell him that they do not need his heavenly father, the maker of heaven and earth, because at least in theory, so they claim, they can create not one, but millions of universes out of nothing. They would tell him that this universe of ours might, for all we know, have been created in a basement laboratory in another galaxy. Nonplussed, the Son of God might dryly remind them that basement laboratories are dark places in more ways than one. As for string theorists, they would tell him about their firm belief that they are working on the ultimate physical theory which would make a creator unnecessary. For the theory would show that the universe necessarily is what it is and cannot be anything else. This would be their trump card against the age-old theological argument that the universe is contingent and therefore needs a creator. Humanly speaking, the Son of God might remind those string theorists that they should brush up on their information of Goodell's theorem, which shows that there can be no mathematical system with a built-in proof of consistency. And since physics has to be highly mathematical, no one can construct a physical theory that would be strictly final. Most string theorists would be taken aback. Nobody likes to be reminded of ignorance of fundamentals. <laughs> How it would be the turn of the Son of God to address them and his audience of scientific minds locked in the admiration of quantities would find incomprehensible the claim that eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, what God has prepared for those who love him. This would frustrate the audience, for this would address man's elemental longing for a sense of purpose, about which science can say nothing at all, simply because purpose cannot be measured. Most scientists are simply unprepared to listen to such considerations. They do not want to accept that science is just about quantities. Or more specifically, and speaking only of physics as the ideal exact science, science is just the quantitative study of things in motion. Nothing more and nothing less. Science is not about being. Not about purpose, not about free will, not about morality. And this says an awful lot. Nothing is more mistaken than to expect science to deliver a proof of the existence of God 
for example, or the creation of the world out of nothing, on the latter point, the expansion of the universe carries us back into the past, to a moment when the entire universe was no bigger than the millionth of a pinhead with all the matter of trillions of galaxies compressed within that unimaginably small volume. Science can trace one state of the physical universe only to another state. But the transition from nothing into being will forever elude the eyes of physicists because simply it takes metaphysical eyes to see the nothing. This notion of nothing is perhaps the most metaphysical of all notions. There is indeed something devilish in the fashionable philosophies of modern physics, especially of quantum mechanics, whose proponents claim that there is a, quote, almost nothing, a virtual nothing corresponding to virtual reality. Such claims lack logical and scientific foundation and witness to an incredible measure of philosophical poverty. Now, the, op the opposite of philosophical poverty philosophical riches, which one hardly ever gets from taking courses in philosophy. If you take a course in philosophy, you will learn what other philosophers thought, but you yourself will not know how to think. This is why Atian Gilsan said that every man must become his own philosophy teacher. As an example of that, I give you what G.K. Chesterton said. He said that the existence of God can be proved by any telephone pole. I would add that the existence of God can be demonstrated by any pen or pencil or table or podium. Why is this? Because these things have limitations. They have specificity. We recognize a pen because it lacks the qualities of all other things. And this sense of limitation of the world being specifically what it is is a great mystery. And so, when one begins to ponder the limitations involved in a pen, one is in fact on the road to become a philosopher. And when one can fall into ecstasies <laughs> in meditating on the limitations of a pen, one is in fact a philosopher. Shy of that, one is merely a professor of philosophy. Yeah. Or, or perhaps a graduate student in philosophy or perhaps a logic chopper. <laughs> and philosophically speaking, unless one considers science and religion as two distinct, separate, and mutually irreducible enterprises, one may be lured, and this has happened all too often, into trying to fuse the two together. The result has invariably been not a fusion, but a confusion. Science and religion are separate areas in more than one sense. First, there is a question of the should, the question of free will and morality. Religion, just think of the Ten Commandments, all of which begin with the words, thou shalt not, is about moral precepts. These have nothing to do with science. Otherwise, Einstein would not have said that he had not derived a drop of moral value from all the hidden science, which was surely very vast and decisive. And this reminds me of something I can illustrate. Truth is what? Truth has a unity, but science deals with one aspect of that unity, and in fact, religion deals with another. I will tell you the story of Lord Kelvin. He was one of the greatest scientists of the 19th century, particularly with electricity and electromagnetism. He had factories built with dynamos and great instruments, and he made a lot of money off of these factories. Well, one day, Lord Kelvin showed up to tour one of his own factories, and then he showed up, they didn't know who he was. And so they assigned him a tour guide, well, a, a young guy like this. And the young guy came, and he showed Lord Kelvin all around the factory, and he told him about amperage, and he told him about resistance, and he told him about voltage and so forth and so on. He gave him a very impressive lecture on the fundamentals of electricity. And then the tour was over. Lord Kelvin said, young man, you've done a great job. You've told me all sorts of things about electricity, but there's one thing you have not told me. 
you have not told me what electricity is. And the young man fell silent and was pressed for him. And Lord Kelvin patted him on the shoulder and said, never mind. That is the one thing about electricity that you and I do not know. What is true of electromagnetism applies to any other branch of physical theory. Newton's theory of gravitation does not reveal what gravitation is. It merely states that what is called gravitation operates along strictly specifiable quantitative lines summed up in the idea of a central field of force. One of its implications is the inverse square law of gravitation. Another is the times squared law of the free fall of bodies. They are exact mathematically and therefore provide for exact predictions. So I reiterate, exact science is the study of the quantitative aspects of things in motion. Nothing more and nothing less. Science cannot tell us what a thing is. It cannot even tell us that a thing is. And far from that, it cannot tell us what science is as, a, as an activity of the intellect. It can't tell us how things work, whereas philosophy can tell us why things are or that they are. And yet these days, we have many philosophers pontificating on the how, and many scientists pontificating on the why, which, strictly speaking, is beyond their limits. Examples of the former, philosophers pontificating on the how, include almost all statements made by Aristotle that relate to the physical world. Another example is Hegel's verbiage about astronomy, physics, and chemistry. When the first installment of that verbiage appeared in 1801 in the form of an essay on how many planets there ought to be, the essay prompted the astronomer von Zach to characterize it as the monument to the madness of the 19th century. The how is a scientific question because the how can be measured and demonstrated. The how relates to the manner in which things work and react on one another. And that is why. Let us suppose that one of our young men is taking a class on organic chemistry. Well, you can go before a statue of St. Joseph and pray before the final exam, but it will do you no good if you have not done your homework. <laughs> and yet, for all its progress about the how, Science has remained impotent to discuss the why of things, that is, their ontological status and origin. When I say that this podium is here, that statement hinges on the validity of the verb is. By using that verb, man recognizes the ontological status of an object, of a thing, in this case, a podium, but science has nothing to do with that status because there are no units of measurement for being. There is not two grams of is, or three feet of are, or four, four fluid ounces of will be. Yet all revealed religion rests and depends on that word, is. And this has been so ever since God revealed his name to be I am who is. And ever since his son referred to himself as I am when speaking to the Jews. And since science is incompetent about the is, it has nothing to do with the manner in which things react causally, that is, as causes of one another. This may be almost as shocking for a modern audience to hear as the Son of God saying, I am, was to an ancient Jewish audience, for it flies in the face of the widespread belief that Heisenberg's uncertainty principle has done away with causality. Surely if science can do away with causality, science has something to do with causality, but it does not. Heisenberg himself thought that his principle definitively disproved causality, which itself is a contradiction in terms. In saying so, he merely prompted the formation of a disastrous climate of opinion 
a climate which may be characterized as the monument to the madness of the 20th century. For instance, for the past 75 years or so, the history of exact science has been a worship of the myth of chance. This myth is the product of a basic error in logic that comes to us from Heisenberg and the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, an error that has taken on a popular currency in the modern mind in the same way that materialistic Darwinism did generations earlier. And that error in logic gives rise to the idea that cause and effect break down at the atomic level. This conclusion arises from the mistaken claim that what cannot be measured exactly cannot take place exactly. The fallacy consists in taking the same word exactly in two very different senses. One is operational, which refers to the impossibility of measuring atomic interactions exactly, as long as one has to work with quanta and the non-commutative algebra of matrix mechanics. The other sense of the word is ontological, as carried by the phrase taking place exactly. Only by the somersault in logic can one infer the second sense from the first sense. And yet, this somersault in logic has turned the modern world on its head. And nowadays, you have people worshipping chance as if it were a god or some sort of omnipotent deity that chance somehow can be operational. This is very different from the notion of chance during the age of reason. What we call chance is not and cannot be except the unknown cause of a known effect, declared Voltaire. Schiller may have paraphrased Voltaire as he put in Wallenstein's mouth the words, happenstance does not exist. In both those statements and many others could be quoted, chance is taken in the sense of non-entity or the opposite of reality. The same sense also turns up in the late 19th century and in a very important context in T. H. Huxley's reminiscences on the reception of Darwin's theory. There, Huxley took to task those who rejected Darwinism on the ground that it was a reign of chance. Do they believe, Huxley asked, that anything in this universe happens without reason or without a cause? Do they really conceive that any event has no cause and could not have been predicted by anyone who had sufficient insight into the order of nature? The scientist Huxley declared is a convert with only one act of faith, which is, quote, the confession of the universality of order and of the absolute validity in all time and under all circumstances of the law of causation. Today, however, all Darwinists and almost all evolutionists speak in a manner of which the title of J. Monod's famous book, Le Hésard et la Necessité, is a capsule formula. They think that chance and necessity can coexist in the very same process because they almost invariably endorse a dismissal of causality which Heisenberg was the first to tack on to the principle of uncertainty. Already in 1927, Heisenberg declared since all experiments are subject to the laws of quantum mechanics, the invalidity of the law of causality is definitely proved by quantum mechanics. This is a drastic interpretation of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, very different from the moderate one, which simply states that there are limits beyond which the scientist cannot measure things. And yet, this drastic interpretation filtered its way, especially in the Anglo-Saxon world, through Eddington and his books and addresses. As early as 1927, Eddington spoke of the emergence in the new physics, quote, of an attitude more definitely hostile to determinism. And eventually, John von Neumann saw in his inability to predict atomic reactions via a mathematic construct of hidden variables an imperative to endorse the drastic meaning of Heisenberg's principles. He wrote, quote, there is at present no reason to speak of causality in nature because no experiment indicates its presence and quantum mechanics contradicts it. Causality, von Neumann added, was an age-old way of thinking which has been done away with. 
causality could easily be rejected in a philosophical atmosphere since time of Hume and Kant had grown more and more skeptical. And the last few decades have witnessed, for instance, the proposition and a very valid one that Heisenberg's principle leads to the multi-world theory, which states that there are as many worlds as there are observers. If such is the case, the fact that scientists, each of whom has his own individual world, or better yet, each of whom is his own individual world, the fact that these scientists can still understand one another becomes a mystery, or perhaps a sheer miracle. Another example of the same process leading to a philosophically disturbing situation is the principle of man-centered objectivity advocated recently by a prominent French physicist. No comment is deserved by this form of solipsism, which has for long been recognized as the inevitable implication of the drastic meaning of Heisenberg's principle, because if you follow the implications of the drastic meaning, which was a false philosophy grafted onto good science, if you follow the implications and a thief steals your wallet, you cannot say a thief has stolen my wallet. There is no causality. All you can say is, I have a sensation of my wallet having been stolen. <laughs> this philosophical atmosphere is an atmosphere of robbery in which people can steal what they will and get away with it. Such an outcome in which to be and not to be are ultimately undistinguishable is nothing to cheer about. At any rate, if it is impossible to distinguish between being and non-being, then efforts to say anything about freedom and determinism become utterly meaningless. Of course, scientists, including the leading spokesman of the Copenhagen School, would never admit that they were not truly free. They deny free will. Well, if they're not truly free, then on what grounds should they accept awards and Nobel Prizes? If they're not free to do the work that they're being awarded for. You see, once objective causality was abandoned, it became inevitable that volition would be ascribed to atomic particles. This was true as early as 1927 with cloud chamber tracks. A cloud chamber track is a visible unity, but the production of this unity is a mystery because the interaction between any two of the millions of ionized molecules involved is not possible. Now, was this visible unity the result of a choice on the part of nature? This was the question that Dirac posed to Heisenberg. To answer this question affirmatively is to undo everything science has stood for since the days of Galileo and Descartes. At that time, science excluded from its domain, and rightly so, questions of volition and free will and purpose. This narrowing of the field of science is what gave birth to science and freed it to do the work that it still continues to do. This is why in Greece there was a stillbirth of science. The Greeks had every opportunity really to begin modern science, but they did not. They did not for philosophical reasons. It was Aristotle and Socrates whose philosophy frustrated the true birth of science in ancient Greece. Aristotle said, and Aristotle was a keen, a man of great intelligence and a great observer in biology, but when it came to physics, Aristotle said that if you have two objects, the heavier one will fall to the earth twice as fast as the lighter one. Now, anyone could have tested this hypothesis by standing on a chair and performing the experiment, but no one did for hundreds and hundreds of years. Why is this? This is because Socrates, in the Phaedo, had to save the sense of purpose. He had to prove that the soul was immortal. He had to prove, and he thought he could prove, that if material things had a purpose and sought out what was naturally best for them, that this saved the entire notion of purpose, even for man and for his free will and his own choices. But you see, a science which tries to save a sense of purpose is not science. It is philosophy. 
This is why Aristotle came up with the doctrine of natural places. This is what led to the stillbirth of science in Greece. Therein lies its tragedy. Therein lies its stillbirth. Because the Greeks thought of the universe as being a living being with choice and volition and organism. But it is not possible to have genuine science, especially a genuine science of motion, about a being full of volition. Such a being can be capricious, and its moves, therefore, unpredictable. Strict predictability, however, is of the exact, is the very essence of exact science. This is why the three laws of motion in Newton are totally free of volitional or animistic considerations. They have to do with objects that have been given a push or a kick. But this mechanical notion of motion, this view can be traced back before Newton to 1348, when John Burden of the Sorbonne took a most original look at some passages of Aristotle's On the Heavens. Burden disagreed with Aristotle that some form of volition moved celestial bodies. In essence, Burden stated that when God made the heavens and the earth, he gave a certain quantity of impetus to all celestial bodies, which quantity they keep undiminished because they move in a realm in which there is no friction with some qualifications. This notion is the law of inertia. Beneath the discovery of inertial motion, however, which is fundamental to modern science, there lay a concept of creation and creator that is indispensable for the formation of an idea of nature which, though fully a creature, is fully autonomous. The prosperity and sanity of science hang on that autonomy. This autonomy could not be conceived within a pantheistic framework. It had to grow from a Christian one. For pantheists, the universe, and it is enough to think of Aristotle and his prime mover, the universe was in continuous quasi-physical contact with the first cause. Thus, this pantheistic universe was a kind of organism <coughs> behaving in willful and not mechanical ways. Worse, since the prime mover was not a creator, the universe could only be an emanation from it, as articulated in great detail by Plotinus. And therefore, the universe necessarily had to be what it is, and about such a universe. Nothing is so tempting as to figure out its workings on an a priori basis. And why not? If the pantheists are right, and if the universe and the mind are generated by the same emanation, it would seem natural to assume that an introspecting mind, being an organic part of this organic universe, should on its own, by introspection, be able to fathom its laws. And if that's so, there would be no need, or at least no acute need, for the physical universe to be investigated on an a posteriori basis, that is, by performing experiments on it. For Berlin's notion of impetus and of an autonomous world which could be investigated, measured, and predicted meant a complete break with all philosophical traditions, all of which were steeped in some form of eternalism, as was also the case with Aristotle's cosmology. For in On the Heavens, Aristotle states that the motion of celestial bodies is eternal because the world is eternal, because the world is uncreated. The eternity of the world was and is a central doctrine for all pantheists, materialists, and agnostics. Aristotle was a pantheist, and therefore he had to believe in an eternal, even in a recurrent eternity of the world. And this excludes for all practices, practical purposes the idea that there was a beginning of motion or of creation. So the idea of impetus, or the beginning of motion, or measuring and experimenting upon nature, which begins with burden, before Newton, before Galileo, this notion rises out of a philosophical and religious matrix which allows science to separate itself from this philosophy and become an autonomous investigation. 
Of course, Berlin was not the first Christian who opposed Aristotle on the eternity of the world. By the time Berlin started teaching at the Sorbonne around 1330, three generations have gone by since Aristotle's work began to be known in the Christian West. With Thomas Aquinas in the lead, all Christian theologians and philosophers of pre burden times had opposed Aristotle's claim that the world was eternal. In the Middle Ages, these scientists accepted the doctrine of the creation of the world. And these men also knew the Fourth Lateran Council, which in 1215 stated that the universe was created in time. This gave, strictly speaking, a definite past to the history of the universe. But even more specific is the doctrine that the Father created everything in Christ, who is the only begotten of the Father. This theological factor should not be left unexplored because all of all other factors one can call from the history of science, all other factors will fail to explain why Burden perceived something that Jewish and Muslim scholars failed to notice. It was just not enough to say that Burden's discovery would have come anyhow. His discovery came long before because the Son of God was seen as the only begotten of the Father. Now this is crucial. The word only begotten in Latin, unigenitus, in Greek, monogamous, has two meanings. One meaning is only begotten son of a father, which we know of as Jesus Christ. The other meaning is the cosmos or the universe. This sense of monogamous, unigenitus, only begotten, appears in the writings of Plato and Plutarch and Cicero and many other ancient authors. Now let us do a thought experiment. Let us suppose that Plutarch, who was the most educated man of his day, let's say Plutarch in the year 110 wanted to see a copy of the Gospel according to St. John, which would have been in existence by then. Well, in reading it, he would have been shocked at the use of the term monogamous to refer to the only begotten Son of God. Because he himself had used it to refer to the universe, to the cosmos. And let us further suppose that Plutarch wanted to become a Christian. If he had done so, he would have had to reject the notion of monogamous as referring to the universe. Because there cannot be two only begotten things. The only begotten was either Jesus or the universe. This means that belief in Christ was to serve as a tremendous antidote to the ever-present lure of pantheism. And everything that pantheism drew us to, a priori assertions about nature, the unwillingness to measure or investigate, the refusal to look at autonomous interactions, the ascribing of volition to everything in matter, but pantheism is still with us. More than 150 years ago, Newman thought that pantheism was to be the great heresy of the age to come. That age has arrived. Dressed either in the wrapping of an ideology presented as science or in the form of the ideology of ecologism. And since almost everyone these days is a pantheist, their great morality comes from ecologism. Ecology, preserving the environment, which is a good thing, but it's not the only thing. These days, public opinion is more shocked and concerned at a half-dead dolphin washed on the beach than it is about the killing of babies as they come out of the womb. And this so-called new theology is full of telltale traces of pantheism, which are borrowed from Kant, Schelling, Hegel, Max Scheller, Husserl, and others. The champions of this theology often refer to science, but they know very little about it. Worse, they talk very little of the word become flesh. They at most talk about the idea of flesh. They endlessly speak of a cosmic Christ, who is the culmination of the evolutionary process, but they do not want to take note of what took place on earth and in very humble circumstances. For the coming of Christ in Bethlehem 
surely was not noticed in Rome or Athens. The moment of his coming was haphazard by worldly perception. Christ escaped Herod's henchmen by mere chance. Luckily, Buradin formulated his law of inertial mo motion before the Black Death in 1348 to 1350. Had he not done so, he might have died during that plague which decimated Europe, including Paris and the Sorbonne. And had that happened, the discoveries of Copernicus, of Kepler, of Galileo, and of Newton might not ever have taken place. And so there would be no, no electricity, there would be no cell phones, there would, there would be no internet, there would be no Facebook. <laughs> As I said before, the only way to explain Burton's breakthrough is that he was a good Christian. Of course, scientists do not have to be Christians in order to do good science. Once the three laws of Newton were in place, they propelled the progress of science on their own terms. And this is because the scientific method, though narrow, has, when dealing with the quantitative aspects of things in motion, a supreme validity. This is most important for those who hold that Christ was the beginning. Since his coming, Christ has exerted a great purifying impact on mankind. He rescued, at least in part, mankind from the shackles of pantheism, which in all ancient cultures prevented the birth of science. China had gunpowder and magnets, but they never had a full birth of science. The Muslims, 80 years ago, had to go to the West to import technology in order to exploit their oil reserves. It was only in the Christian West that science achieved a true birth. But in modern times, the doctrine of, of pantheism or eternal recurrence is prominent. It has reappeared in the writings of Nietzsche, who knew no science, and in the writings of Whitehead, the first-rate scientist, according to whom the universe would take on all possible forms throughout eternity. For in pantheism, there can be no strict beginning, but there is one in biblical revelation. The universe was a necessary emanation in all contexts except in the Christian context. And that Christian context owed itself to belief in Christ through whom God created the law. That is why Catholic Christian religion, unlike all other religions including non-Catholic forms of Christianity, had not yielded to pantheism and still resists it. In other words, Christ is the savior of science, but in a way that has nothing to do with the doing of science. Christ, or rather belief in him, is the only begotten son of God, rescues science from the stillbirths it suffered in all ancient cultures. Now, I will make a couple comments and then wrap this up. One of them is that it's very tempting, both for scientists to be bad philosophers. And Einstein said, no scientist is a good philosopher. It is also tempting for those in theology to try to do bad science. You see, theology is freed if we understand what science really is and what it really does. Science deals with things that can be measured and investigated. Science deals with quantities, which themselves are a great mystery. But it is very tempting for theologians and those who are religious, for instance, to say, well, religion does the same thing that science does. Therefore, Genesis 1 must be taken literally. This is a great mistake. We know, at least from evolution and from Darwin, that we cannot strictly say that God created each species separately. At least at this point, scientifically, we cannot say that. We can only say that if we impose Genesis 1, which talks about a religious meaning, onto science, which has nothing to do with religion. And we cannot take uh, the, the chronology of the creation of the world in Genesis, literally. This is as much as a, a mistake as scientists trying to do away with causality or other metaphysical notions of which they have nothing to say or should have nothing to say. Therefore, theologians or exegetes should be grateful to quantities, so to speak, because quantities can perform a purifying effect on theology. 
whether biblical or other. Quantities ground the truth of the statement which may have originated with the great Cardinal Baronius, a statement by Galileo who did not seem to understand the full bearing of it. The Bible teaches man not how the heavens go, but how to go to heaven. This is a much more profound statement the more you reflect upon it. As noble laureate Sir William Bragg wrote, quote, from religion comes man's purpose, from science his power to achieve it. Some people ask if religion and science are not opposed to one another. They are, in the sense that the thumb and fingers of my hand are opposed to one another. It is an opposition by which anything can be grasped. To grasp with the mind is to comprehend. And when the light came into the world, the darkness could not comprehend it. For beyond the grasp of science and beyond the grasp of anything shy of revealed religion, the purpose of life and the final cause of the material universe is God who is love. And in that love, it is in that love that religion completes all the progress it is capable of. Religion completes all the progress it is capable of in love, and so does science. It was recognized long before science and recognized by revealed religion. <coughs> and it will need to be recognized by us even more so in ages which will be increasingly scientific. That love, Christian love, will be around long after science is gone, long after we are gone from this earth. It was revealed religion through St. Paul which said that love never ends. Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For I know in part, and I prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put aside childish things. But now we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face. This is true love, and this is the secret of the purpose of human existence. It's more than just seeing God face to face. It is being in the presence of his love. And it is that culmination which only Christian love can bring us to, where we find the true harmony between intellectual honesty and Christian love and the teachings of religion. In that we find the true harmony between science and religion. And in that exercise of love, we find the true crowning of all process science and religion go through. Well, I think I've said enough because I have to do another one here in a minute. Thank you. <laughs>twice, I think, uh, over here, and our friend, I'm not, I don't remember anymore. Father Julian. Julian. Father Julian knew uh, Father Yaki. Father Yaki was, as you can tell, an amazing man. My name is Kevin O'Brien. I'm with the Theater of the Word Incorporated. We are foolish enough to travel the country evangelizing through drama, which, let me tell you, if that thought ever occurs to you, it's not a good idea. <laughs> At least it's not a good idea from a worldly perspective. We've been on the road all month. We were in at Mount Rushmore about two weeks ago, and all, we're driving the whole way. We do shows. Father Yaki, of course, is a very specific thing. Uh, I'm doing him again one more time today, and then again in Rochester, New York. But after that, I don't think anybody's going to want to see this, because it's kind of difficult. But what an amazing man. We have some of his books for sale at our merchandise table downstairs. If you buy some books or give us a donation, it goes to help defray our expenses. We do lots of other shows. This is my third year here, and I'm very honored to be back here. I love this conference. Last year we did Scenes from Hamlet, as explicated by Joseph Pierce. Uh, 
in studying the Catholic elements in Shakespeare, and the year before that, I was blessed Dominic Barberi, the Passionist priest who received John Henry Newman into the Catholic Church. So this year was, in a way, the biggest challenge. Not so much as an actor, but I read probably 30 of Father Yaki's books. Father Yaki is a writer where you can't read one book and get it. You gotta read about a dozen before you start to see the threads and how they all tie together. I think he's important as I think you heard. There's a lot of confusion between science and religion. And I think especially young people, there's a lot of young people the age of these young fellows here who are simply atheists and they're proud of it. I was, I was an atheist myself. I was, and, and I, an amazing conversion brought me into the church. One of the reasons atheists have for not believing in God is they think that science has somehow eliminated the need for his existence. And it's not true. You only begin to think that if you buy into bad philosophy. But as you see, Yaki was a brilliant philosopher and a brilliant scientist and a man with a true heart that loved Christ. A rare combination of things. And again, he understood that by starting with objective reality, we can, um, we can achieve a lot. That's when we get confused there that things go astray. Anyway, I can answer some questions, not as Yaki, but as myself. And yes, sir. And do you believe in what you have been doing? Is that are you are an actor? As an actor, do you have to believe in uh, your message? Um, well, you don't have to as an actor, no. As an actor, you just play a part. Of course, I put this together, so I believe it. I will say the more I read Father Yaki, the more I think, there may be better ways of describing what he's trying to describe. It, you, you struggle when you read him. Um, and I think, you know, there may be bits and pieces here that, that I disagree with. For instance, he never quite makes it clear that whereas science and philosophy or science and religion are separate things, you can't do anything without philosophy. You can't do anything without metaphysical assumptions. I'm sure he says that somewhere. But he doesn't say it enough to remind us that, well, science is metaphysical. It's when science uh, adopts bad metaphysics that science is frustrated. When science has the proper philosophy, which, as he said, came forth from the Christian milieu, science is empowered. When it doesn't, it's weakened. So I do believe in this, but I would say, Yaki, I don't think Father Yaki's the last word on the subject. However, I think he did some amazing work, and I'm hoping that other Readers and writers and scientists and philosophers out there will continue in his tradition. Yes, sir. How would Father Yaki view the efforts of this, uh, during this conference to break the gap of the conflict between religion and science? Well, I think he was very suspicious of anything that tried to bridge that gap because I think he saw both from the fundamentalist Christian mistake in trying to make a case for the literalism of Genesis, and he saw in the um, sort of the Tao of physics stuff that has been popular for a a couple of generations, he thought that was suspect too. That this notion that somehow we can get um, more than what science gives, more than an understanding of how things interact from a quantitative part of view, point of view, uh, an understanding of, of, of predictability of that. I mean, when he says science cannot even tell us that the thing is, much less what it is, I think he's being very bold in saying science is very narrow, but like a knife, the narrower it is, the sharper it is. And if we make that too, too blunt, we can get confused between what, what science intends to do. It's one of the reasons I thought Father Yaki should be here. And I'm glad Jamie agreed with me. Even though Father Yaki died in 2009, had he been alive, he would have been here. And he would have been fairly irascible. I didn't know him well, but I hear all these stories about Father Yaki being, wow, he was difficult. <laughs> I think one of the reasons he was difficult is he suffered a lot of persecution, particularly among scientists. It, it, scientists did not want to listen to what he was saying, but it's clear from reading him that he understood science and mathematics and philosophy better than almost, almost everyone, I mean, at least better than many, many people do. And so he, he was a character, and had he actually been here, I think he would have, uh, he would have caused a stir. So <laughs> this is the next best thing. I'm his, I'm his stunt double, so to speak. Yes, Jim. Kevin, I think you are too kind about his prose style. I find it completely impenetrable. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for bringing it to life in a dramatic, uh, captivating, and, and uh, entertaining way. I wonder if Father Julian, who amazes us with his circle of friends, uh, would care to share any thoughts or reminiscences of Father Yaki. 
He was at Fordham. Fordham. Yeah, he was at Fordham. Fordham. Yes. Then he could have been at Princeton okay. later. Well, uh, do you know, the other student, they be interested to know, how he happened to get into the study of, of science and to pursue a PhD in, in science? Well, I think I know, but I will let you tell it. Well, I understood. Uh, when he finished his doctorate in San Francisco, he went to teach, boy, to teach theology at St. Vincent's in La Trobe, Pennsylvania, which is the sort of Monte Casino in America. And while teaching dogmatic theology there, uh, he got, something went wrong with his throat, Lanta, and he lost his voice. So he was unable to teach. So, went off and pursued further studies I pursued the study of, of, um, of, of science. I think uh, specifically physics. But it was a matter of, well, divine providence. <laughs> he had never studied science before. And he was, I'm sure, very, uh, very orthodox, certainly very intelligent 